Cześć, dzień dobry. Witam Cię w kolejnym odcinku podcastu Człowiek, Biznes, Technologia. Tym razem będziemy mówili po angielsku. So I will switch to English because I have amazing guest today, Mike Bechtel. Hello, Mike. How's it going, Bieszek? Very well, very well. How about you? Oh, other than jet lag, I feel great. All right. So it's kind of like really far away from Chicago to Warsaw. So thank you for, you know, possibility of having you here. It's absolutely my pleasure. Yeah, so maybe I will start with a short introduction because the list is kind of impressive of your ex, like ex-consultant, ex-venture capitalist, professor, ex-CTO, and now chief futurist Deloitte. What does it mean even? Oh boy. Well, I'm the first to admit that it, it's been a, a, a long and winding road, but as chief futurist, I'm the first to further admit it can sound maybe a little crazy, right? How, how does one predict the future? Well, yeah. I'll tell you in a bit. It's not even that much about predicting. Right? It's more about preparedness. But really, my team and I work to make sense of what's new and next in tech, mm. right? A more boring way to say what I'm up to is I'm an emerging technology research director. But All right. what's the fun in that, right? Let's talk about the future, right? Let's talk about possibility. Because without m meaningful storytelling and insight, nobody's going to be reading these white papers. All right. So let's, let's start with the storytelling. I like, sure. like the idea. Uh, with a little twist. So let's switch to movies. I'm, okay. the, I'm the movie guy. And I'm the science fiction movie guy. Okay. And the science fiction is all about the future. Yeah. It's about the possible future. Yeah. So if you need to choose one movie who is the closest to your vision of the future, what it would be? Oh, boy. You know, when I think about accuracy it, or, or uh, imagined accuracy, I think about any science fiction that sort of imagines the same human conditions and human problems, but at some scale. Mm. And so one of my favorite books, and then it became a, you know, a, a movie with some mixed reviews, but I really enjoyed Ready Player One. All right. And not because I think that the real world will crumble and the virtual world will take its place, but because I, I love this idea that e even in a virtual world, class still matters, right? Even in a virtual world, knowledge still matters, mm. right? Even in a virtual world, you have people acting from a place of passion, and then you have antagonists, bad guys, you know, acting from a place of greed. And so when I first read that book, I thought, well, this is clever and, and, mm. and simple. But the fact that I still think about it years on, you know, that it became a, a film, I think, okay, here we go. Digital and physical better together. That movie really stands up. That's kind of interesting because... I wouldn't say that's my favorite movie, but what I was trying to describe to to my wife and to my kids, what could this metaverse world mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually the example is there. And also we are just after the introduction of Apple Vision Pro, which kind of like bring this vision really close to us. What's interesting to me is that people fixate on the form factors we have today. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeshek, when I, when I meet with a client and I say, do you want to wear a toaster on your face to work? The answer is always no. Yet, yeah. You know, pick your, pick no. your negative. No way. But do you remember eight track cassette tapes? Of course. Yeah. Those were not very good either, but they were a transitional tech, right? They moved us from big vinyl towards portability. And so to mm -hmm. your point, when I, when I think about today's headsets, what I see is an 8-track tape. It's moving in the right direction, mm. but the real end game are going to be great-looking glasses, one-day contacts, 
that allow us to bring our own bits, paint our own pixels wherever we need them. And here's the punchline. This is exciting to, to me, to my team, mm. and I think should be for our clients. Not because it's shiny, but because it's simple. Think about all the time we spend with our heads down on these little 16 by 9 rectangles, right? Mm. How cool would it be to only have digital info where you need it? Uh, that, I think that's possible. All right. But how about this, you know, I would say digital think digital addicti addiction thing right that yeah. we are really addicted to technology right and oh. with all the social media stuff and I, even if you say that okay i need to take my phone and check it all the time my feet etc right. right but then having that all the time just here or even the contact glasses yeah my internal pessimist or skeptic it just yeah. you know saying watch out watch out other <laughs> so. there's there's a great, there, there's this, there's this tendency, I think, with tech, emerging tech specifically, mm. to um, demonize or canonize, to make it hero or villain. And I think in truth, Vyashek, it tends to be shades of gray. There's positives that can come with mindful use. There's negatives that will come with mindless use. Regarding screens, you know, one of my colleagues, he said, if you're worried about people becoming cyborgs, becoming robots, mm -hmm. just try to take a phone away from your, your teenager, right? They'll get the shakes like addiction. They already are. Yeah. And so I think some of the right-headed approaches to, at least on the human-computer interaction side, which I know is your area mm -hmm. of specialty, they're the things that try to substitute mindlessness for mindfulness. And I remember when the watch, when, when, when the watch came out, the, the, the Apple watch and similar, um, some of the early critique was we're going to spend more time on screens. Some of the early research showed things like this helped us spend less time on the phone. And so hopefully, you know, hopefully the future is, fewer, more meaningful interactions and not sustained brainwashing. Yeah. yeah, but just going back to the movies, uh, one of the recent discussion that I have, like even on my one of my WhatsApp groups, just yeah. the day before yesterday, it's about this movie called Her. Oh, yeah. And with the Scarlett Johansson, women, yeah. you know. Joaquin Jacques, Phoenix falling exactly, in love for digital yeah. ScarJo. Yeah. And that's, that makes me, even before our conversation, I was just thinking that the future of the technology is the technology that would be the most human, right? And what I love within that vision, that it was clearly the human touch of technology. And it was, I still in love, both in Scarlett Johansson's voice, but also the vision of this really touching technology. Yeah? Part of the reason I was excited to join you on your podcast was your recognition that, you know, business and technology clearly better together. But the human factor connects both, yeah. right? It's the third leg of the stool. You know, take another emerging technology that I, I deal with every day, right? I, I have 25 years mm -hmm. as a, a guy dealing with newfangled things. I've seen a lot of hype cycles. I've never seen anything like the excitement and fear around generative AI. And... The reason I bring it up is I have people come up to me, Vishak, they say, oh, my goodness, it's going to kill creativity. The robots are killing humanity. What are we going to mm -hmm. do? A and to be honest with you, every example I've actually seen in production is amplifying mm -hmm. human creativity. I, I give you a real quick example. I was at a meeting between C-level executives in Dallas. And I showed a CEO. I said, hey, sir, this is last December, mm. December 22. I said, sir, this thing can paint a picture of anything you want. Anything. The guy, clearly a successful leader, but unaccustomed to thinking mm. imaginatively, he goes, paint me a sunset. <laughs> 
<laughs> now listen, Bishik, everybody in the group kind of groans like, ugh, like uh, not interesting. Right? Mm-hmm. The picture that comes up, not interesting. But here's the, here's the important part. He looks at the picture. He goes, well, it's just a sunset. And my takeaway was the machine is not disappointing. You, sir, yeah. are disappointing. His lieutenant, his chief of staff comes in. She goes, okay, I want to see corn chips versus potato chips in a fight. The corn chips have squirt guns. The potato chips have nunchucks. It's all on Mars. Yeah. The picture comes up. Everybody celebrates the machine intelligence. Interesting. I'm sitting there thinking, let's celebrate her. Imagination matters more. Humans matter more, not less with these emerging techs. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the, the whole art of prompting, how we call that, yeah. it's amazing. I mean, I, when I started to, 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 to play with, uh, with Jenny and stuff, and in this case with Mid Journey, because before our, uh, our audition, I was telling you about my, my camper van, right? Yeah, yeah. So the idea for my camper van, it was still pre, uh, before pre-COVID, was can I transform Mercedes Sprinter into something I called post-apo camper van? So <laughs> yes. It was actually, there's even a hashtag on Instagram, post-apocalyptic camper vans. And there's a whole movement of, you know, making kind of like Blade Runner type of... Uh, type of a van, which is kind of a black, painted like right. a little bit rusty. Uh, my friends, they're, they're even laughing that it's, you know, against the, the vampire stuff, etc. Like, really for the end of the world. Right. So one of the first things was, can I create the picture of my van with Mid Journey? And I started prompting. Okay. okay. Can you create, can you imagine the Mercedes Sprinter Camper van based on Mercedes Sprinter in the post-apocalyptic world, prepared for uh, for the world without water and food, and to fight against zombies. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the prompt. Yes, and it happened. And I can t- I can show you later on. It's exactly the same van that I have. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's really. But, I mean, but this, this again to me, the celebration is that you even thought to ask. Like, like Vyashek, what makes that, to me, a mechanical miracle is that you thought to conceive of this idea, right? It's, it's to me, a people and machine better together story. Uh, it reminds me of Tony Stark. If, if you're into that lore, and here's a good mm-hmm. science fiction example. You know, Tony by himself is a genius and quite impressive. Of course. He also has these drones, these bots that fly around without a person inside. They're also quite impressive. But Tony plus the suit, that's the superhero. And so one of the human things that we're seeing in our research, man, is that every time you're tempted to think about the elimination of a human job, it's actually an opportunity to pause and say, no, it's a chance to elevate a human to focus on better problems, higher tasks. There was a NASA engineer I talked to. He literally said, it's like, yeah, we're using generative AI to build rocket ship parts. And I said, are you worried about it? that? He says, no, because I now get to focus on getting to Mars faster. Exactly. So I kind of also used AI to be better prepared for this podcast. Spend the quality time with you during our lunch Instead of preparing the questions. <laughs> Tell me more. So there was this prompt that, can you prepare the questions with Mike Battle for my Trovic Business Technology podcast? And Mike is the chief futurist officer for Deloitte. And the first one was like the following. What was the Eureka moment or inspiration to drown you in the world of futurism? Oh my goodness. Well... A celebration, again, of both the the machine doing a good job and you doing a good job asking the machine. You know, my my journey to current, back to that long and winding road, um, I would say it's fairly unique. And I don't for a second pretend that I knew what I was doing on each move. Um, I started as an inventor. I was working at a different professional service firm. 
I was, you know, focused on creating new technologies where best practices would not do. Because what, what I learned early in my career of Yeshek was sometimes businesses want to emulate a best practice, right? They want to play catch up to a leader. And I think traditional technologies and advice mm -hmm. can get you there. But what I started to notice was that many of our clients were less interested in what the, the big guys were doing. They wanted to know what the, what the cool kids were doing, mm. right? Don't show us how to play catch up. Show us how to play leap frog. Yeah. yeah. And so after about 12 years as an inventor, I thought, okay, let me put my money where my mouth is and become an investor. And so as, skin in the game, skin in the game, man. Yeah. And I thought, how hard could it be? Right. I understand the difference between real interesting tech and, and snake oil or, or fake tech, you know, we got vaporware, slideware. Boy, was I wrong. Specifically, I learned that there is so much more to a successful business than just tech. And, and, and in fact, you know, I like to say, take it from a, a, a 25 year geek tech comes last. Mm. Right. And so we did okay, right? Like we, we got our money back and, and made our investors whole, but it was clear to me that my future wasn't to be a banker. And it was this recognition that I said, what is at the intersection of sort of inventing, investing, the possible, the profitable? And I thought maybe, maybe it's helping enterprises, companies, startups, everybody be better prepared to mm -hmm. digest these emerging techs. And so that was really the futurist moment. It was, hey, maybe I can be a guide, almost like a Sherpa, mm -hmm. to help explorers and entrepreneurs alike uh, better profit from tech. I like the Sherpa thing. It is kind of interesting but because when I was involved in our kind of like Deloitte repositioning project, we created those uh, kind of like positioning anchors, right? So you know, few different directions that we can go as a brand. Yeah. And Sherpa was one of the most important, right? Because Sherpa, it's when you're just, you know, and I love mountaineering, right? I'm sure. Probably never got to Mount Everest, but when you want to go to Mount Everest, it's really hard to go alone, right? So Sherpa, it's first of all your guide, but it's also helping you to go there. Right. So it's not only, only, you know, just telling you what to do, but just right. taking you there and make you proud. That's, right. I love this. I love it. Love this inspiration, but what actually, you know, if you can be a little bit more concrete, yeah, like what does it mean to be futurist? I mean, sure, this is kind of like you know, somebody can say fluffy stuff. <laughs> I have to oh, predict yeah. future. Well, I'm going to put that predict verb on the side and come back to it in a second because I want to answer your question clearly without too much fluff, and then we'll come back to the word predict. One of the main questions I get, of course, is just this, right? And, and I remember there was a lady in, in New York City. She said, what, do you got a crystal ball? Right? You got, you got a time machine? Is it a DeLorean? Right? Oh, it, I love the movie. Yeah, yeah, that, that should we, we be both to, of our answers. We need but, to follow those movie yeah. metaphors. I love the movie. <laughs> well, movies from here on out. But, you know, essentially, what, what's your secret? How do you do it? Well, I'm going to start with a quote, and the quote might sound fluffy, but bear with me. Do you know the old William Gibson quote? The future's already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. All right. It's from his book, Neuromancer, 1982 or so. Another sci-fi classic. classic. Oh, yeah. Anyway, at Deloitte, one of our privileges is that we're so global and we work in all sectors. And so, if you believe that the future is already here but not evenly distributed, and you make a point of literally traveling the world, you know, here I am, Warsaw, yeah, to understand little faces of the future that are being built today, mm -hmm. then 
you can spend some real principled time figuring out the subset of those which figure to be tomorrow for the rest of us. The analogy, right, the analogy that I like to use is that like on our phone, right, on our phone, see these three lenses, right? normal, telephoto, wide angle. There is no telephoto into the future. Turns out the wide angle is the telephoto. Right. Right? Now, but here's the rub. People say, you know, they, they say they understand it when, when you say that NASA could teach Warsaw a thing or two. Right? That sounds reasonable. Mm. But I'm here to tell you, Warsaw can teach NASA a thing or two. It goes both ways. And so what is a futurist? We are a cross-pollinator. We are bringing faces of the future into other markets in both directions. Mm. And that is, in fact, how we can do the work with sort of substance and rigor because we don't predict. And, and that's really the, the, the reason I, I jumped on predict is prediction is pretending you know one future and very likely getting it wrong. We like to say we project. Think of it like a flashlight. Here's a collection of possibilities, a smaller collection of probabilities, and outside of all that preposterous, you know, stuff that probably won't happen. But the whole name of the game is prepared, right? Mm -hmm. We want our clients to not be surprised when the future hits them. And this is, I, I should start this episode in also mentioning that you are one of, of the authors and actually continuing the, the amazing job of our Deloitte Tech Trends report, which is actually kind of like be, the report was presented in that, ep, in that podcast. Like, if you're watching that or listening, you can also jump back to the episode 108 uh, with Anja Wioncek that we've been discussing that. And I've been looking and list and reading and watching the, the, the Deloitte Tech Trends for a couple of years. Mm. And it's kind of interesting that you can actually see that looking into the future is actually going also to the past and see the line, right? Oh, and man. this this projection, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, right? Yes, I, 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 I... You said it well, and I'll simply say it again. To be a futurist is secretly to be a historian. Right? We talked mm. about the wide-angle lens. Now let's talk about the rear-view mirror. One of the big things that our team did a couple years ago, we took a look at the whole history of information technology. And when I say history, I don't mean, you know, back to mainframe computing or COBOL or anything. Mm. I mean 1842. I'm too young to remember COBOL. Mm. <laughs> You're killing me. You're killing me. But... But it, it, this blew my mind. The first machine, the first proper general purpose computer conceived in 1842. Mm. Charles Babbage ate a Lovelace, London. I saw a full-scale model of this thing. It was the size of the table we're sitting at, it's like, a, like a Volkswagen. And what was so cool, man, Babbage and Lovelace talked about these three things that made it go. There was an interface layer. I this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it, 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 you know, you fed it, you you fed it clay tablets, and it printed clay tablets out mm -hmm. the back. You know, but early HCI, early human computer interaction. Yeah. Then it had a thing they called a store, and what was funny, man, like all the parts they explained using the the the, the technology jargon of the day, which was farming. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, the store holds. Arithmetic, like a silo, holds grain. And you're like, okay. And it got me thinking how database cans are always represented. Yeah. like. You know, that. And then they talked about a, a mill that would process the, the numbers like a reaper might turn you know, wheat into flour. Which is computing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess the reason I go into this is to say, it's pretty much just been those three tracks for 200 years. Mm. interfaces always get simpler. Right? Da Vinci, the greatest form of yep. sophistication, simplicity. So from the mainframe right, to the um, uh, GUI, 
or well, command line interface to the GUI to mobile to VR. About the command line, and it's, I know that it's a lot of those small stories, but literally like three days ago, I was just, you know, kind of like going across different Insta stories or whatsoever. Yeah. And I saw this, <laughs> this stories about, I don't know if you, if you ever played, this was the first Formula One game on the PC, still in like CGA graphics, really like, you know, the <laughs> yellow black thing. Yeah, yeah. And it all started in MS-DOS with the command line. Sure. With the big floppy disk, you know, going in. And I said, yep. wow, I still remember when I still, I still remember the, the text uh, interface, right? When sure. you were only, I even play text games, right? Within MS-DOS, Like right? Zork. Exactly. And I still remember the first time that, you know, my dad just go, take the floppy disk, insert, open five, blah, blah, blah. And I saw the graphic interface. I say, wow, that's amazing. It, huh? it is amazing. It, each of these is... A, is a, it, it, and then I still remember the windows. And I said, wow, it's even... Like, this I, is a graphic interface. Yeah. Well, Stolen by, from Mac. Yeah, well, Stolen from Xerox. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. The, his history, uh, his history is complicated there. But every meaningful user interface, interaction, evolution has been driven by a mix of richness and simplicity. And every meaningful information advance, right, up to AI, which we mm -hmm. talked about earlier, is, is driven by new forms and flavors of machine intelligence. Every computation advance is driven by the ability to do more with less, right? Stronger machines. And so this idea of simpler, smarter, stronger, because we see that as the undefeated history for mm -hmm. 200 years, that helps us as futurists then look forward. And when we see a, 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 an AI tool which promises mm -hmm. something smarter, you say, even if we don't like it, the tailwind of history says it is inevitable. Right? This genie is out of the bottle. When, when you see a, a user interface that a, a four-year-old can use, as parents, we say, I don't know if I like that. But as computer historians, you say, I don't know that you can change that. Probably not. But the, to that point, I mean, I was thinking before that, that podcast, like, what is actually the future? And if I need to predict the future, this... This frame of prediction is kind of changing and definitely it's, I would say, getting smaller and smaller, right? So probably like 500 years ago, I can kind of predict or project, as you say, yeah. uh, what's happened like in terms of the technology and economy, like 100 years or even 200, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's getting, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller. Probably if you ask somebody in the 80s uh, or in the 60s about the future of technology, there were some dreamers who were kind of like the writers expecting, you know, the computers. Then, of course, if you ask Stanley Kubrick about his vision <clears throat> in another great movie, he would tell you that there will be a computer, which is AI driven, right? Yeah. Of course. But now I'm thinking that can I predict or project even five years? Right? Yeah. Because I think with AI being unlocked in yeah. a way, I just keep on asking myself, is this projection line who was kind of like predict, which was kind of predictable, wouldn't be go like this or even like, like this? <laughs> yeah. It's, there was a book I highly recommend. You know, it's an old book about the future called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler, mm. one of the founders of the modern future studies movement. And, and in that book, he talked about this idea that the future is literally coming faster. And he speaks to what you're, what you're saying because here's the thing. Technology, generally speaking, is exponential. Mm. Um, logarithmic, you know, pick, pick your more mathematical, you know, accurate term. But the jump from Charles Babbage to the first mainframe in New Jersey took a hundred years. The jump from that mainframe era to the mini computer command line era took 
about 40 years. The jump to GUI took 15 to 20. The jump to mobile took about 10. And the jump to VR took about 6. And so because the future is literally coming faster, and again, not in a fuzzy way, but in an exponential function way, our flashlight, mm. right? Think of that projection as a flashlight. Our flashlight necessarily can't shine as far. No. And it's getting narrower and narrower. Right, narrower and shorter. And so I think that this might be, I've not thought of this before, but here mm. we are on your show, revealing a new possible mm. concept, brother. <clears throat> I think maybe this is why we're seeing the emergence of so many futurists and future studies teams because what used to feel like a 20-year fuzz exercise is now clients saying can you help me make sense of next month <laughs> but that could be a nice metaphor why don't why do you need so many futurists because if every one of those flash lighters is getting smaller and smaller and you get more people yeah then maybe we'll get hopefully this well it reminds me remember linus torvalds the, yeah. the, who made Linux, yeah? Um, he had this great quote 20 years ago. He said, given enough eyeballs, all bugs become trivial. Mm. And what he meant was that the open source community had an advantage that a corporation might not, namely uh, 100,000 eyeballs shining lights. And so I think you're onto something, Jacek, that given enough lowercase f futurists we're less likely to be surprised. Let's see. But going back to this, when you mentioned from 100 years to this, like yeah. five to six to, to VR, do you know how long did it take to get the first million people in OpenAI? Back then, November 2022. Oh, man. I, I know directionally it's astounding but but blow my mind man what how, how long so if it? you said that it took 100 years to the, get to the mainframe yeah i can tell you that the first million people using ai was five days five days and then 100 million people was two months two months yeah have you well we've talked about how you've used it for today's questions as, as but that was that, that was my personal research. <laughs> uh, have you found these tools helpful in your everyday life yet? Still getting there, I need to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I need to, in my case, I still need to remind myself, okay, so maybe I will be better prepared for our conversation yeah. using AI. But yeah. this is like I'm mentioning because I just think that this movement of like making open ai open and chat gpt uh, in an essence and that make that democratize the access to the technology right and i think that is something different than it used to be right oh, even yeah. even within open source movement this is bigger well you know five years ago i would be in front of my clients talking about how large language models could create Shakespeare of a quality that would fool a Shakespeare scholar. Yeah. And what was so interesting, Deshek, was that people would, people would, you know, a business executive, a CEO, would sit thoughtfully in that chair, and you could see behind their eyes, they're thinking, yeah, but my business doesn't do Shakespeare. Right? Mm -hmm. What is the business case guy? You know, this mm -hmm. is... And then last November, from a geek perspective, what I saw was what I think you saw. This was an evolution, somebody saying, let's put a chat box on front of something we've been developing for mm -hmm. 10 years. And suddenly it's socialized. It's democratized. It's, it's like a powder keg going off. From a geek perspective, it's, it's just an LLM transformer. But I, th I think you make a great point that something about inviting everyone to the party has proven magical. Is it scary? Or is it, is it more a 
possibilities in here or is it more risk in here from the futurist perspective? Okay. So this is important stuff, right? Mm -hmm. To me, all technology is a tool. When I hear the word technology, I do a mental sort of control C, control replace. Mm -hmm. And I always say to myself, tool, right? Here's the thing about tools. Tools are extensions of people. All the way back to like Homo habilis, mm. Australopithecus africanus, the history of humanity is a history of primates using tools. So for me, I know this might sound a bit poetic, but a knife is a tool. You can use it to make your dinner and feed your family and in turn grow your family. An evil person or a mindless person can use this as a weapon. Mm. And so if you fast forward the wheel, right, it can be used to bring joy to a child and speed up a commute. It can be used to build a tank. Right? Gen AI, mindfully used, I think it will transform the way we work and live because it will force amplify the right kind of people's mm. right kind of ambitions. Used mindlessly. It's a weapon in the hands of children, and nothing good comes from that. So the trick, in my humble opinion, Hollywood, media, journalists, their job is to celebrate humanity and ensure truth to power. And so the stories we see in the media or from, from hardworking, smart journalists typically paints emerging tech as a villain. The black mirror. Yeah. I think marketing and PR departments paint it as the hero, the white mirror. It's all good all the time. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think part of my job, I, I wake up in the morning feeling my responsibility is to show both sides and the shades of gray to my clients. Mm -hmm. Because the extremes, the, the big dumb binaries, it never turns out that way. True that. So, but I can still think that you are in this more or less white mirror optimistic part of the business. Yeah. In here. Well, ye yes, and here's why. Here's why. Mm -hmm. I think as a personal and professional value, mm -hmm. I am on the side of the creator as opposed to the critic. I think it's easy to write. We, we call them in, in the States think pieces, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, op-eds. I think it's easy to write an op-ed about everything that could go right, could go wrong, et cetera, right? But as much as I love, say, you know, Roger Ebert, the famous movie critic, mm -hmm. I think I, I respect more the Steven Spielberg, right? The maker, the, the people mm -hmm. who are in the arena, if you will. And so to me... The thoughtful creator changes history. The thoughtful critic writes down that history. But, That's a nice quote. Oh, thanks. But I, I think this is the reason I'm an optimist, because I think we are the heroes we're looking for. And we are building these technologies, not the other way mm. around. I mean, they're shaping us, sure. It's a feedback loop. But at the end of the day, last time I checked... We're still running the show. <laughs> Yet. Yes. So uh, as a CEO, right, because you are talking to a lot of CEOs, right? Yeah. Even today we have the meeting with the top Polish CEOs here in Deloitte. Should I be worried that AI will eat my business? Or should I be worried that I'm not leveraging my business enough to be competitive? Yeah. So the advice I typically give a CEO And, and, and when I say typically, I mean daily, <laughs> because everyone's talking about this right now, is I, I, I usually open, I say, listen, ma'am, sir, AI is not going to put you out of business. Competitors thoughtfully using AI will put you out of business. Because think about it, back to the tool thing, whether or not you're 
tribe is pro knife or anti knife, mm-hmm. the fact is the tribe next door probably has a knife. Of course, right? And so the first thing I say is don't think of this as a as magic from heaven. Think of it as a tool, a tool your competitors are wielding. Two, I typically recommend, I say, listen, when, when we think about, as a business leader, when we think about Gen AI, naturally, the first thing that comes to mind is cost reduction. Efficiency. Efficiency. Um, automation, cost takeout. Right? I, less I, I, labor. Yeah, less labor, the whole thing. My old business partner used to say, Mike, you know, you can't shrink your way to success. And what he meant was that it's fast and easy, and I would argue a little lazy, to say these tools can allow us to do the same thing with less people. That might please Wall Street for the next quarter. Mm. But business history is filled with companies that outsourced and skinnied up everything they did. And then one day, right, found competitors showing up who beat them by doing more, right? Right? There's a famous computer story, right, well documented in the public press. Uh, Clayton Christensen writes a lot about Dell. Mm. Dell outsourced pretty much all of the manufacture of their components. And then one day, the Taiwanese manufacturers like Asus showed up with world-class PCs because they, <laughs> their, their exhaust was their input. Yeah? So where I'm going with this is CEOs need to look at this not as a tool to shrink and take cost out of the bottom. They need to look at this as an opportunity, finally, after years of complaining that we have a shortage of talent, scarcity of resource. Say, look it, we've just freed time for Agta and Tomac and, you know, uh, Krisha. We are getting better and better in those names. Thank you, sir. Janku, yeah. To, we freed these people's time to work on higher order problems. Mm. And so I think Gen AI as a shrink strategy, short-sighted. Gen AI as a growth fuel, that's going to be the exciting story. That's interesting. I never thought, I mean, I've been thinking of that, but now I can have a new look on that. So that could be kind of the answer of, you know, aging and aging Western developed societies. Yeah. As you said, shortage of labor. Um, everybody's talking about that. In Europe, definitely, you know, we have older and older society in Germany, Switzerland, even in Poland, it's, you know, the projection, uh, it's, it's getting worse and worse. But what does it mean for the developing economies or for those economies who kind of like leveraging the situation of the big population like India, like China, right? Yeah. Well, I've, never, I've never been thinking from the economic perspective on that problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, Like most of these things, I think it's shades of gray, right? I, I had a, an interesting discussion with a gentleman yesterday who said, you know, there are poor, poorer regions of the world, less developed, maybe a more polite way to say, yeah. where people are earning pennies to train these machine models. And that feels very dark, right? That feels like humans literally working for machines. That's not good. But on the flip side... You know, one of the things about AI is that it's been sucking all the oxygen out of the room. It's all anybody's been talking about. Mm-hmm. The third emerging technology that we think is a big deal, besides the VR metaverse, the AI stuff, it continues to be blockchain tech. And when I say that to people in 2023, they say, ugh, right? Because we've had a year of NFTs and FTX and SBF yeah. and all this stuff. But the truth is, blockchain reconceives the world's computing resources and financial resources as a single interconnected sort of trustworthy grid. Mm. Now, why am I bringing this up? Why am I changing the topic? Because I haven't given too much thought to AI 
in the developing world and implications. But blockchain tech, the developing world is all over that. Because decentralized finance, digital currencies, the friction is so reduced to get in and create mm -hmm. a business. You could create a business right now in, you know, you know, Central Africa that takes payment with digital currency. Whereas you would have been locked out of traditional banking, traditional currency, et cetera. And so like the AI piece, there's good, there's bad, but I think mm -hmm. the future belongs to the people who find usefulness. It's interesting that you mentioned blockchain because it was one of my next question, actually, you know, how to navigate the old hype around those, you know, Bullshit bingo <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So because I mean, yeah, you're 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 working in this business for so many years to just you saw the hype moments, right? Mm -hmm. Around metaverse, um, around blockchain, right? Yeah. Now around AI, the question is the hype or is the reality that's the other one, right? Yeah. Like I mean what from your perspective, let me start with that. What are the most frequently asked questions about those stuff? So if you talk to the CEOs and the people around the world, you mentioned AI, VR, blockchain, AI, mm -hmm. metaverse. So what else? Yeah. So which of those is the most discussed? Many, any others? Or any others? Well, again, we try to resist the blizzard of buzzwords. And, and the reason we look back is so we can kind of group. Um, I think at the interface front, beyond virtual augmented reality, spatial computing and and the metaverse type thing um a lot of the interest comes in two other places they're a little further out but they're 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 going to be coming one is the idea of ambient computing have you ever heard of of this concept kind of i think yeah if you can you know tell yeah. it a bit more it, ambient computing as it's called at mit uh, amazon uh, deloitte it's this idea that the next great wave of simplicity will become machines that can infer and predict and meet our needs before we have to ask. So you meet the new venture of Elon Musk, right? With neuroscience. Yeah. yeah. And what's funny about that is that would be sort of the generation after ambient brain computer interfaces. Exactly. Yeah. Thought reading and thought writing. Now, ambient computing says, we're going to use the data we have about you, not read your thoughts, mm -hmm. perhaps, but using all the data we have, we can infer that you're flying to Warsaw. And so you're going to need, you know, the car charged up. You're going to need the passport at the ready. You're going to need all these things like a butler. Remember years ago, Clippy? And Microsoft Office? Of course. Right. We called it spinach in Poland. Spinach. Spinach, yes. This is my favorite <laughs> Polish word I've learned. <laughs> and the chip, spinach. The problem with spinach... It's a little bit different than spinach, right. but spinach, yes. Spinach. The, the problem with spinach was that he, he had the right idea. Right? It looks like you're trying to write a letter. But he was blind to the world, right? He was yeah. on a 20 megabyte... Like, what'd you say, your first computer? Uh, it was PC XT. XT, right. XT yeah. Yeah. He, he could have the best intentions, but he was deaf and blind. Yeah. But was it like Windows 2000 or which one was the first one? It was probably like Windows 98, 98 2000, uh, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the deal. Imagine a version of that, right? a computerized butler, which is informed by cloud compute, cloud data, gen AI. Now you're getting something like Jarvis from the Avengers. Yeah. Then you add the brain reading, right? My granddaughter, mm. she won't have to ask the thermostat to change the temperature, right? The thermostat will know from her spinal column that she's cold. Yeah. And so are those ready? No. But I think after the computerized creativity hype settles down, mm -hmm. we're going to start to see that there's a new wave of 
computerized concierge. I mean, as I understand, we are a little bit going to that direction with this Gen AI based co pilot stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still not connected to us. Not connected to us. And not conscious. And not, yeah, not self aware. Skynet <laughs> is n no reports. Another great movie. Another great, yeah. Yeah. I was I was reaching for things that weren't quite so dystopian. Um, this, the best sci-fi is always dystopian. It, it is. It is. I don't know why, but it is. Well, yeah. it sits with you, right? Yeah. Cautionary tales. Yeah, but going back to business, um, like we talk a lot about, you know, the big words like those AI, metaverse, all that stuff, right? And I, as I said, I'm going back to this question about navigating the hype, right? Yeah. How to decide? I mean, you were. Uh, the venture capitalist. You were yeah. kind of like investing the money, but you said you invested in 15 companies out of 3,000. Yeah. That was your we, story, We said right? no. We said so no you, exactly. 2,900 times. Yeah. You said that you were pretty good at saying no, right? Yeah. And navigating the hype is about saying no. It is. It's through dividing, you know, what is really important and can get traction and could be impactful for my business from the bus. How to do that? Well, I think it's a funnel that requires a healthy mix of optimism on the top and skepticism on the bottom. As a venture capitalist, we realized that we needed uh, two roles in the firm. We called them Mr. Yes and Dr. No. Mr. Yes never met a startup he didn't like. He was at the cocktail parties and the networking and yeah, we'll talk to you. Dr. No hardly ever met a startup he liked. Because he was the skeptic and the diligence and the, like, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. So, for emerging tech, one of my favorite quotes, you know, Carl Sagan, the, the science communicator, the scientist, cosmologist. Mm -hmm. Carl Sagan says, you have to keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. What he means is, curiosity at the top, entertain all these harebrained things. Right? recognizing that most of them are hype. But then, figure out the subset that actually show business value measured in, I was going to say dollars, mm. but is Zloty? Zloty, yeah. Zloty. Yeah, yet, hopefully Euro. Your, well, in yeah, the near future. I was reading see. about that. Yeah, that's right. Not yet. Not yet. But too often, people become so infatuated with the novelty that they forget that everything that's ever mattered saves time or makes money. Mm. And so the first filter for us is let everything into the top, Mr. Yes. The second filter is can we show a clear path to time saved or money made? If yes, then we move into which of these vendors or companies best delivers the value proposition. Mm. Okay. And so it's sort of a two stage diligence. Is the concept lucrative? If yes, which of these vendors or, or, or softwares, right? Uh, technologies is the best manifestation of the vendor. And then finally, what are the deal terms that, that ultimately um, make for a good partnership? You'll notice that most of those have nothing to do with science and technology and mm -hmm. futures, right? They just have to do with good business. I think that's why analysts like, but not limited to Gartner, have always had that hype cycle. Yeah. And things are high, hero, then villain, then useful. I think start studying it while it's high, but probably don't, you know, start meaningfully deploying full-blown capital to things until you figure out that it's useful. But do you think we should kind of like investing, sometimes investing without even the visible business case? That we, as with AI, I mean, those business cases, they are around, still not yet, we cannot judge. Yeah? Right. But should I invest in now? Would you put your own chips into that? I would put my own chips into a diversified mix, yes. Um, in venture, one of the paradoxes is that you know you're going to be wrong seven out of ten times, mm. 
But there is a period of years where you, by definition, only have three investments. <laughs> and so here's what I mean. If I'm an enterprise, if I'm a CEO or a CTO, I say, much like you would in, in finance, you would buy a total index fund to diversify and hedge risk. We recommend to our clients to take a percentage, and I, I can get into this if, if you're interested, but you take a percentage of your technology budget and you allocate that to Future Watch. These are a portfolio of small experiments and explorations. The goal is not earning. Mm. The goal is learning. Most of those will fail, but those failures are teaching us. Then that money gets redeployed into the, you know, the slow winners, gets redeployed into the medium winners. This is how you get from seeds to saplings to you know, big trees. It all comes down to portfolio theory. So yes, invest early, but not in any one. Mm. Invest in a basket of seeds. Interesting. That's, so there's a nice connection between you as a venture capitalist and a futurist and a consultant. Interesting connection. Thanks, man. And I, from that back at one of the last questions, right? How you, what you would recommend on how to implement this kind of thinking about the possible impact of the technology to our business into the strategic thinking? Because, you know, when companies, when our clients creating those strategies, the strategies used to be five years. Yeah. Now I'm seeing that nobody's just looking at five-year strategy, just kind of really too difficult, like three-year stops, right? But what I'm seeing, it's like, it's thinking that, okay, so what are our challenges, our goals, how we would like to, you know, to put it, and then what kind of technology we should implement to achieve those goals. Yeah. But I can ask the questions, what's the strategy we should take to answer the technological changes? It's a different question. It is. You know, um, this morning I, I had an opportunity to speak at the, the In Summit event, which was a, 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 at the stadium. The ne hundreds of enthusiastic innovators, right? So very, very excited group. And the title of my, my remarks, I called it Innovation for Realists. Because I came to that group not as a futurist, but as someone who's seen innovation go wrong. Here's what I would say. If you're thinking of technology first, you're doing it wrong. Take it from a geek, tech comes last. I think what we need to do as strategists is we need to lead with need. We need to spend more time listening to our customers and clients and figuring out where they feel stuck, right? The itches that need scratching, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 the hangnails that need fixing. Armed with that, that's where a, a, a team like mine, right? That's where a futurist team can be handy because we can say, before you invest in yesterday's solution to today's problem, check out this shelf of futuristic stuff. Because when you're applying these newfangled technologies to real problems we're solving, suddenly it feels like real business, a business case, mm. right? I like to say we want to get our clients to their preferred tomorrow a little ahead of schedule. That doesn't come from show and tell AI, VR, metaverse, mm. blockchain. It comes from saying, oh, you have a customer loyalty problem. I bet we could solve it elegantly with one of these new tools. Yeah. So strategy, listen more, right? Uh, talk less and lead with need, solve with future tech. That would be amazing closure of this podcast, but it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> just, no, I mean, I just, at the end, I just, and I happily, uh, you reach the, the customer context, right? the client context. And I, you know that I told you that by heart, I do believe that it's everything starts and ends up on the, on, the, on the user, on the customer. Even the name of the podcast started with Człowiek. You almost kind of like 
try to tell it. Chovek. 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 Okay, that's nice. <laughs> so that's that's a human, right? Um. So we talk a lot how this big technological technological changes impact business, right? So what metaverse means to the business? What how AI will change the way that we drive the business, how we compete with the others, right? But what does it mean for us as a people, us as employees? I mean, what could mean to us in the future? Yeah. Well, I would argue that in this age of omnipresent devices, screens and in this age of machines being not just better than us at math but better than us at poetry um, in this age of, of, of computers that um, can prove something uh, immutably for a hundred years that believe it or not people matter more because all of these stories are stories of Force multiplication, amplification of what? Of the original ambition and insight and humanity that created them. When I think about, when I think about an employee or a person or a human, I think we've spent 25 years telling everyone you have to major in STEM. Science, technology, engineering, math. Mm. Why? Because we need you to be more, not less, like a machine. Master calculation, yeah. master engineering, et cetera, et cetera. I think what we're seeing right now is this recognition that what we need to focus on is our humanity. The machines will outmachine us at every turn. Mm. Not in a Terminator way, right? In an efficiency and effectiveness way. And so, studying the liberal arts, studying the classics, studying logic, first mm. principles, right? In the 90s, the ch discussion was calculators in schools. Yeah. Should you be able to use that? The answer was yes, if you've mastered the basics, right? And so I think we're going to find people getting back to basics, back to values, to empathy, to relationships in a world where we finally realize that there's things we do best and there's a set of things that machines do best. And that could be a lovely ending because, as we all know, the computer, as you mentioned, was created by Ada Lovelace, who was a poet. Yep. So the computer and the technology, it is actually a product of our creativity and poetry. Couldn't have said it better myself, brother. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for that. I'm... I can expect, and I feel that it's not our last conversation, to be honest, and looking forward to our next one. And yeah, and I need to say that I'm still a techno-optimist, even after that conversation. Oh, it warms my heart, and it would be a pleasure to be back with you sometime, brother. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Janko, yeah.